United Airlines cares about your safety, sort of. A smartphone that scans your eyes, and a lot of people are mad at Reddit for trying to police harassment. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 338 for Thursday, May 14th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. And you can connect Dropbox for Business with over 300,000 apps for project management. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is the show where we talk about the tech news with the people who care about it as much as you do. First, an update to a story we reported this morning on Tech News Today. An earlier report by Fortune said that Apple's Internet of Things device HomeKit had hit a few snares and would be delayed. This afternoon, Apple called the Fortune report false, and a spokesperson said, quote, HomeKit has been available for a few months, and we already have dozens of partners who have committed to bringing home accessories to market, and we are looking forward to the first ones coming next month. Now joining me today to talk about more tech news is Ian Thompson from The Register. Welcome, Ian. Welcome. Pleasure as ever. How's it in San Francisco? Is it rainy there like it is up here? Um, slightly humid, yes. I've got a feeling we're going to get a shower or two towards the end of the day, but uh, quite frankly, we need the rain, so fair, fair plays. <laughs> yeah, so you have a story today up on the register that might not be the biggest story of the day, but in my opinion, it is definitely the most bananas. You say that United Airlines has a new bug bounty program where they're going to pay security researchers to find flaws and errors in their web portals, but instead of paying them in something useful, like money, they're paying them in air miles. So I have a United Frequent Flyer account, and I can tell you that the miles are pretty much useless. So tell me more about this story that you wrote today. Well, it's, it's, it's a quite a baffling one, really. I mean, bug bounty programs have been around for a while, but generally catch is involved because researchers have to pay their bills like anyone else. Now, United's taken the view that rather than give actual money, we'll just give frequent flyer miles instead. So, you know, for finding a very low-level floor, you're going to get 50,000 miles. For finding something slightly more medium, maybe a quarter of a million miles. And the big prize is a million air miles uh, for finding something which allows, which allows remote code execution on their site. Now, that's all well and good, but I don't know about you. I mean, obviously, you've flown United. I'm not really sure that it's, having flown it a couple of times myself, that being able to travel for free on United is really that much of a benefit. I mean, I actively pay other airlines more just to not do that. So the concept of, of, of sort of working, working my fingers to the bone trying to find vulnerabilities on their website just for the privilege of being shouted at by rude, rude attendants is not really my idea of a good, of a good time. No, it does. I mean, you know, it's like saying, well, thanks for, you know, making sure that our planes don't crash into each other. But, you know, you can't actually travel those days or those days or those days because they're all blacked out. That's the experience I have with United. So, like, what what does Google pay for finding flaws? Oh, I mean, well, Google will pay you up to 30 grand for a good flaw. Um, Microsoft, uh, Facebook has paid out over 3 million since they introduced their bug bounty program. Even Microsoft, who held out against this for so long, are now spending hundreds of thousands of, of dollars paying off people for finding serious flaws in their work. I mean, it's a win-win because the research community gets an income with which they can you know, do legitimate security research and not be tempted to sell out to the black hats. And the companies save themselves a fortune. I mean, if you think what a serious flaw would cost United in terms of lack of, you know, loss of corporate reputation, the financial cost, the cost of clearing up the problem from a serious hacking attack, it's an enormous amount of money. And to try and fob people off with air miles, I think is really quite shocking. Right. I mean, this isn't the first thing, this first crazy security thing they did. I mean, just last month, they kicked the security researcher off the plane because he tweeted about, you know, some of their vulnerabilities, which kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, it was people would be scared. And he was talking about, I think that, you know, he had access to turn the oxygen off or something. Um, but, you know, it's like it's like they have no idea about anything about the security community at all. That's it's, what I, I don't know if this translates to an American audience, but in the UK, we say penny, penny wise and pound foolish. You know, it's this, this concept of you know, well, we'll be cheap in this area 
and it'll save us money. But you don't realize that if you're cheap in that area, it opens up to a massive expense otherwise. And it's not just a financial expense. I mean, if United Airlines systems get hacked, they lose an awful lot of business just through the loss of corporate reputation. People don't feel comfortable flying at uh, the best of times, and they certainly don't feel comfortable flying if they yeah, they know the security is being shortchanged. Right. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they back down on this, but, you know, it just seems silly. But it's not the weirdest the thing they've done. The food is horrible also, so that's comparable. Oh, <laughs> tell me about it. I never knew you could make a sandwich taste like that. Yes. <laughs> so we talked about this on the show yesterday briefly, but you have a story up today that I thought it would be worth mentioning again. Microsoft announced nine, kind of win nine kinds of windows yesterday. Um, it sounds like it sort of goes against what they talked about in January, that it was going to be more streamlined and you know, it was going to be Windows 10 on everything. Um, but now there's, it's, it sounds really complicated, is it? Um, it's, it is and it isn't. It, it's complicated by the fact they've got rid of the whole concept of the phone operating system and they've bundled that into Windows. So that's where two of your, your options come for. Basically, it breaks down into if you're buying it as an individual, you've got a choice between Windows 10 Home, which is the basic version, and Windows 10 Pro, which gives you some extra tools for things like cloud and security and device management. If you're buying on a licensing volume basis, then you've got Windows 10 Enterprise and <clears throat> Windows 10 Education for those two particular markets. Then with a mobile phone system, you've got Windows Mobile and Windows Mobile Enterprise, which takes us up to six. And then you've got embedded versions of Windows 10 for Enterprise and Enterprise Mobile. And finally, of course, an Internet of Things version of Windows 10, because everything's got to be Internet of Things these days. And that's really a tiny cut down kernel version of Windows 10, which goes on low, low cost controllers, which you can spam out everywhere. So it's... Technically, I mean, for most people, it's only going to be a choice between two versions of Windows if you're a home user, two versions if you're a corporate user, and then two versions if you're a smartphone user. But it just, as you say, they were talking about it's just going to be Windows 10, it's nice and simple, and then you've got nine versions of the thing. It's, um, it just seems to be going rather against the earlier hype. But then again, we're used to that from Redmond. Right. I mean, they could at least come up with 10, right? So it was 10 versions of Windows 10 that would make more sense. I should imagine someone in the marketing department said exactly that same thing. And it's just like, can you not do like, I don't know, Windows for toothbrush or something? Yeah. That way we can just get a round number. You know? Exactly. For monkeys. That's what I would say. That, you know, they need a special yes, version. Yes. Twitter really does seem to be getting a bit, bit monkey obsessed at the moment. I'm getting slightly nervous. Yes. <laughs> so the newest technical build of Windows 10 Mobile is out, and uh, the, your re the register has a piece today written by Neil McAllister. He says that as universal apps come to Windows 10, we should be prepared for some rough sailing. Uh, what does he mean by that? Um, well, Windows 10, I mean, to get us to this stage, Microsoft's already running a little bit late. Uh, not massively late, just a couple of a couple of weeks. Um, in terms of how 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 mobile is going to deal with this, though, we've the the concept behind universal apps is a really good one. It's an app that you can use both on your mobile phone and on your desktop PC. Now, obviously, they're going to have to change the UI to fit the different the different form factors. Um, but in, it's it's all a question of. How, when are we going to see this work? Now, obviously, Microsoft is using its Office apps as like the you know the the showcase thing of how this should be done, but there's an awful lot of uh, of ways uh, ways that this could slip up in terms of third party developers of apps. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some Microsoft partners out there who are especially being groomed through this process. But for your common and guard or app app developer, then it poses a unique set of problems that they haven't had to deal with with Windows before. So I think there has to be a certain amount of care on this. Also, bear in mind that Windows 10, supposedly, is going to be out before Windows 10 for the phone. So you're going to have to, there'll be a certain shakedown process when Windows 10 is released for computers, and then that'll be applied to the mobile side of things. So I think developers are going to have a lot of sleepless nights between now and ooh, so fall, maybe, when, Windows, when the phone version is launched. And it's just going to be making sure that their apps will work properly in both environments. Right. So the the summer is when we're going to see Windows 10. They don't have a release date yet, but they just keep saying no. the summer. And then Windows Phone, are they saying when that will uh, be released? Again, they're, just, they're saying in the fall. So if I was a betting man, um, or I, I am a betting man, but if I was betting on this, um, I would say Windows 10 will probably be out late summer. They've set themselves a very ambitious deadline, and they don't want to screw this one up. So basically, I think they're going to make sure that Windows 10 for the PC is solid. That way they don't annoy their core audience. And then Windows 10 for the phone will launch, I would expect, about six to eight weeks later. Um, 
I mean, they're hoping then that they'll be able to roll out a whole series of smartphones running it as well and try and get, you know, their smartphone operating system share out of single figures. But um, whether or not that, that, that'll that be done remains to be seen. I, I have to admit to being more than a little sceptical on that front. Right. So tell me about this other story you have about the Fujitsu smartphone that scans your eyes. Yeah, this this was a bizarre one. Um, Fujitsu has got a, a phone out which they're launching in Japan with NTT Docomo, um, which wants to get around the whole trying to remember your password or whichever gesture swipe system you use and instead has a has cameras in the front which will focus on the iris and use that as a biometric authentication system uh, to actually get into the phone now it sounds pretty good but these have been tried for ages now and there are some significant downsides to the technology if you're for example the US military and you use this to control and you use this to control access to uh, research areas or certain weaponry systems, then you can build a very good system which holds the head in position, has a camera uniquely focused onto the eye and a fast database of things that it can cycle through. But we're talking about a smartphone, and curiously, a smartphone with only a two megapixel camera to do this iris scanning. Right, you say that um, the, the camera on the back is better than the one on the front that would scan your eyes. The camera on the back is 20 megapixels. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, they could have skimped a bit on the camera on the back and put a better class camera in the front. Now, since writing the story, I've spoke to a couple of security experts who are saying, well, the actual megapixel range of the camera isn't as important as how it can focus on the software behind it. But even they were just like, two megapixels is really pushing it if you're going to make this work. And bear in mind, this is access to your phone. If you get locked out and it refuses to accept your iris, you know, you've just got a, a quite expensive paperweight, which isn't going to help you meet up with your mates after after work. So, uh, I don't know. It, the concept is good. The execution, I have serious doubts about. Right. I mean, maybe they'll have, like, the backup, you know, like the iPhone does. You know, if, your thumb, oh. if your thumb is wet, then you always have your password. Yes, I, I would hope so. I mean, so, I mean, speaking personally and, and as a technologist, then I would never, ever trust Iris as the sole point of access. It could be a second factor of authentication for certain certain programs. But, you know, unless you are terminally forgetful and can't remember a four-digit password, I'd stick to that for the moment. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ian Thompson, writer at The Register. Do you have any other stories you're working on that you can tell us about? Uh, there's a very interesting one that should be going live later on. Are you familiar with the rotary dial master lock uh, combination locks? Uh -huh. Someone's Yeah, someone's just released a machine, an open source machine, which can crack that in 30 seconds. So if you're at high school and you've got one of those protecting your locker, yeah, watch out for the geek with the tinkering machine. <laughs> Right, is it a 3D printer or something that does it? Or is that... uh, well, it uses uh, standard off-the-shelf servo motor and stepper motor, but the whole thing is encased in 3D printed parts, and he's got a 3D printed bezel which fit, fits onto the front of the lock and rotates it so that you can find the combination. Well, maybe we'll need to unlock our lockers with our eyes then. <laughs> well, they've worked for the last 100,000 years, so I think we'll be okay for that. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure as ever. Take care. And you. Coming up, Google is locking down Chrome, and here comes Erasegate. But first, many of you use Dropbox. We do, too. At Twit, we use it to sync and share files, everything from sharing audio MP3s, large graphic files, invoices, and probably a lot of other super secret stuff that nobody tells me about. Over 4 million businesses throughout the world use Dropbox. Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and have visibility and control over your data. The best thing about Dropbox for Business is that you don't have to introduce a new platform to the people you work with. Dropbox for Business works just like the Dropbox you already know and love. That means less training and more productivity. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with one terabyte, and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. You have control, and you can rest assured that the right people get access to sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business has security baked right in, plus it integrates with third-party security and administration solutions such as SIM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. You'll find all the necessary security features like single sign-on and two-step verification. Take advantage of the fact that you and your employees already use Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. 
On to a few more stories we're following today. Social networking community Reddit announced new practices to help curb harassment on the site. The new policy was posted in the Reddit blog and further elaborated in a Reddit thread. Reddit admins will now be in charge of investigating instances of harassment instead of leaving it to the Reddit moderators. Now, many commenters in the thread complained that the blog post and the response were too vague. I thought they were pretty clear. Reddit defines harassment as, quote, systematic and or continued actions to torment or demean someone in a way that would make a reasonable person, one, conclude that Reddit is not a safe platform to express their ideas or participate in conversation, or two, fear for their safety or the safety of those around them, end quote. The Verge reports that Google is tightening control over Chrome and blocking all extensions that are not found in the Chrome Web Store. The move is designed to keep unsuspecting web surfers from downloading malware that's attached to third-party sources. This was first announced in May of last year, but if you were using the developer version of Chrome, you could still download whatever you you liked. Now developers can only install third-party extensions locally. According to the Washington Post, Minecraft is officially the most streamed video game in history with over 42 million Minecraft videos on YouTube today. According to this mother of two 10-year-old boys, please tell me something that I don't already know. Welcome to Erasegate, my friends. That's the name I've just coined to describe the flaw in the Apple Watch that I download blog described today. If someone steals your iPhone, it's not at all easy to reset the phone to bypass the passcode. That feature is called activation lock, and it's been around for about two years in the iPhone since OS 7. But with the Apple Watch, there is no activation lock yet. So while your personal information is not accessible on your watch, if someone steals it, a criminal could just pair the watch to another iPhone if they've bought it at an Apple store. We're seeing that right now. According to Jeff Benjamin at iDownload blog, when you repair a watch, there's no request to verify the Apple ID, the ID that was used previously. So a thief might not know your exercise or your heart rate logs from last week, but they will now have your Apple Watch. But this is not unlike anything else someone could steal from you, and most things you're not wearing on your wrist at all times. So perhaps a race gate is a little bit of a hyperbole. And finally, Search Engine Land reports that SmartBot Wolfram Alpha has a new reverse engine, reverse image search. This isn't the first reverse image search out there, but this one is particularly good, and it includes all the information already been built into Wolfram Alpha Search Engine. I gave it a picture I took of a tree in my backyard, and I identified it not only as a tree, but as a California box elder. And it listed its scientific name, as well as its USDA hardiness zones, natural life cycle, and more. Then I tried again, and I gave it some art from the brand new Female Avengers comic book, and it was just a little confused. All it said was instrumentation. I have no idea what that means. But you can actually help it learn by saying, clicking the little orange button that says, what the heck? And I did, and I explained what it was. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific because it's exciting to watch live. You never know what's going to happen. And if you're a fan of this show, go post a review on iTunes or YouTube or a bathroom wall or wherever anyone will let you post a review and send us your selfies watching the show. Today's TN2 selfie of the day is Alessandro from Pescara, Italy. He wrote in to say, I follow you every evening and I find your program very interesting This is the picture my 11-year-old daughter Camilla shot while watching you. Thanks to you and your daughter for watching. I love to see your selfies. If you want to be on the show, just tag a picture with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email to TN2 at twit.tv. And tell us a little bit about yourself. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.